Eric Pfeiffer is a dedicated leader and professional leadership coach who believes in the transformative power of culture. Eric understands that most leaders and organizations lack the tools to assess or recalibrate their culture, and he aims to demystify this process, helping them transform culture to serve their mission rather than being controlled by it. He believes that leaders can only lead others to the degree they can effectively lead themselves. I was like a lot of people in my early 20s, kind of post college, going into the workforce, and um, very early on, for a variety of reasons, started you know gravitated toward this conversation on leadership and and knowing that I, I I wanted to be promoted, I wanted to take on more responsibility within the organizations I was a part of, um, but I think also simultaneously running into a lot of. Uh, what I, what I would call brick walls, like, you know, moments where, you know, somebody was calling me on the, my boss was calling me on the carpet about something, being challenged for a variety of things, people challenging my character, my personality, the way that I spoke with people in, in terms of communication. And I think at that early stage, I started feeling a little bit like, okay, I want to be a great leader, but I, I have some, some, some really important unaddressed questions that I don't have clarity on, which is number one, what does it mean to be a great leader? Uh, Cause at that point I was, I was already starting to consume a lot of, you know, biographies on historically quote unquote great leaders. And I was reading a lot of leadership books and, you know, podcasts hadn't come out by then. That's, that's how old I am. But, um, and I think I, so that was a big question. What does it, what does it mean to be a great leader? And, and, and then like, if I read about this great leader, what, how much of what, who they are and what they've done can I actually borrow and how much of, of this journey doesn't need to be really my own journey. Uh, secondly, I was um, continuously frustrated by not knowing how to translate what I was reading either in these biographies or not knowing how to translate all of this great leadership literature that's available into practical day in and day out kind of, you know, uh, leadership habits, uh, you know, for lack of a better phrase. And Thankfully, right around that season in probably my late 20s, um, I I came across a gentleman um, who would eventually become a, a long-term mentor of mine. And he, he talked about leadership in a way that I had not yet heard or read about. He modeled it in a way that I had not yet seen. And that so much kind of captured my heart in a sense of like, wow, not only is this person talking about a vision for leadership that I can buy into, but they're modeling it in a way that feels really integrous. And so I ended up spending about 13 years apprenticing. That's what I call it, for lack of a better word, um, apprenticing under this uh, individual. And, um, and, and, it, it, part of that journey was he started a coaching consulting organization um, not long after I met him. And so he invited me, he said, Hey, if you'll, you know, we're going to, we're going to build our headquarters in South Carolina. Uh, and if, if you would come and give me a few years, um, I will, I will teach you and train you in everything I know in terms of, of leadership uh, an understanding of leadership, leadership development, training, all that stuff. Um, and then when you're ready, you can go do whatever you want to do. Well, I went and joined him in this coaching business and I got, I got what they call a twofer. <laughs> I, I was able to apprentice under this individual and, uh, grow leaps and bounds and so much faster, I think, than I would have ever grown had I had, had I been just doing what I was doing, which is kind of picking little pieces from a lot of places. Um, and at the same time got into the work of coaching. And in the beginning, I wasn't coaching anybody. I was just, you know, his, you know, whiteboard carrier slash, you know, dry erase marker carrier slash driving materials and resources to different events and training contexts and really assisting him. But my gosh, I tell people all the time, there is so much power in proximity just by being with him in all these sessions and by being with him on airplanes and in cars. And, and it was always the space in between the, the formal training and all that, where we were just having these offline conversations. My growth was catalyzed or expedited in a significant way. And then in parallel, I fell in love with the work of coaching because I was really coaching in many ways is just kind of transferring what we've learned, our journey, the best of what we've learned in our journey um, uh, to other people to give them a, a better 
chance of succeeding on their journey. And so, you know, I, I ended up being, it's, it went from three years to about, I don't know, maybe 13 years, uh, worth of working with him. And then, uh, about seven years ago, my wife and I decided, Hey, we want to move back to Southern California, which is where our families are from. And, and, uh, you know, we've, we've learned more than we, you know, bargained for. And so I came back and really kind of dialed in on what particular expression of coaching do I want to participate in? Because the co- the world of coaching is so broad and diverse. And so um, I, what I honed in on was I fell in love with the work of engaging with um, high level leaders, executives, the, the real, the decision makers of any organization. And as, as they go through a process of trying to overcome the obstacles, hurdles, the challenges, getting unstuck, you know, in the, in the development of their organization and in particular on the human side. Um, and so when people ask me like, what's, what's your area of expertise as a coach? And I say, you know, I'm really, I'm really good at helping uh, people get unstuck, teams get unstuck, organizations get unstuck when it comes to how people operate individually and collectively. Um, so people, you know, we, we talk, we fly under the banner of emotional intelligence and, you know, organizational health and cultural health, um, because I am a huge advocate that I, I believe even with the advent of AI and no matter how advanced it gets, I still believe people will always be the engine of any business. Um, and when that engine's operating uh, more optimally, the business is more productive and effective and profitable. Um, and that's been proven time and time again. Um, and when that engine is not running right, then the business will begin to flounder and stall out and uh, it will see diminished returns, even financially. Um, and so when I when I realized I could invest in the people of an organization and see those radical outcomes, um, I thought this is... Um, this is fantastic. And then, and then somehow along the line, people started calling me the firefighter because for whatever reason, when I go in to work with, you know, I've worked with a lot of family owned and run organizations, a lot of private organizations, you know, which most people don't realize that is the majority of organizations in our country, <laughs> you know, the majority are not publicly owned or, you know, you know, corporations, you find out that um, usually I'm being brought in when uh, excuse my French, the shit is at the fan. There's a lot of, you know, turmoil, dysfunction, distrust that has brewed over time. And so I just, for whatever reason, David, I found that I, I love that space. I love being able to jump in where it's hottest and scariest and to partner with those people to regain a sense of clarity and confidence and courage. So that's essentially what Empower Coaching now uh, is is all about. Nice. So you're getting in there when you're most needed and making the biggest impact in a relatively short amount of time, I imagine. What would you say are some of the common uh, kind of bottlenecks or friction points that you're seeing when you go into these organizations? Yeah. Uh, one of them, right off the top of my head, one of, one of the, the single most common bottlenecks is the, the, the leader who thinks everybody else is the problem and is struggling to practice enough self-awareness to realize that the change that they so desperately <clears throat> want to see within their team or their organization um, is most likely going to have to start in them. And that's a, that's a very difficult thing, I think, because of what I've discovered is, <clears throat> number one, leadership is a very lonely uh, adventure, right? Um, and uh, when you're the, the further you are towards the top of the pile, the more lonely, the more rarefied the air is. Uh, so the challenges are greater, the, res- the level of responsibility is greater, and that often drives people, oddly enough, into isolation, into a sense of nobody knows me, nobody understands what I'm going through, which is fair. Totally understand. I, mean, I run my own organization and I feel that way a lot of times. Um, so that's one big bottleneck, their, their unwillingness to, to ask for the help, to seek the help that, that they personally need um, to lead more effectively. I think <clears throat> another bottleneck is and this is kind of more of a systemic issue, but like, let's be honest, how much leadership training do we receive in formal academic environments, you know, through middle school, high school, college, grad school, you know, I did some of my grad work in uh, organizational leadership. And I remember thinking, you're not really teaching leadership, you're teaching system structures and, 
<clears throat> this, these theories that I don't know are really going to help an individual leader move the needle on anything in their organization, right? <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, another big bottleneck is um, this, what I would call, it's a, it's a feature of a culture. Culture, in my estimation, is, uh, forgive me, but this is the easiest way to describe culture. People, what is culture? Everyone's written writing books on culture and how to change culture and understand what I say. Here's the easiest way to understand what, what is culture. This is how we do it. This is how we do it. Like that old song, right, that everybody knows. Uh, that's culture, the prevailing attitudes and behaviors that people operate with in any context, right? business, family, you know, subculture group. Um, is really that's that's what culture is is defined by or is 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 reflected in, and so very often what happens is the the culture without realizing that people get caught up in the pre existing culture, and that becomes the norm. That becomes like this is the way we've always done it, and and it becomes acceptable. And so that becomes a huge bottleneck that people have a very difficult time identifying is how much the culture is like the air we breathe. We've all seen that funny cartoon about the two fish swimming and, and one says something about water and the other one's like, what's water? Like, you know, they just, I don't know. I don't know. I've been, I've been that's what I was born into is what I've lived in. <clears throat> and so people's, um, the, the kind of what, what I'm, and I'm saddened by this, um, but this sense that culture is an enigma that we can't quite put our finger on it and therefore it can't be changed. And therefore we don't know how to, or make attempts um, to change. Well, that's a, that's a big ball. And then maybe the third one I'd say is how frequently organizations um, abdicate the responsibility of leadership development, training and culture development to HR departments. Um, that's becoming more and more popular. It's like, hey, HR will solve it. We've got all these dysfunctional issues. These 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 employees can't communicate more effectively, <clears throat> and so we expect HR and HR directors are usually well under equipped, not any fault of their own. And so, what do they do? They just go online and they hire some coaching or consulting group or a person to come in and do a, a three hour workshop or an inspirational speech which are fine. They're great, but that's not really going to move the needle on anything. And so they, you know, they, or they send a number of their sales team or their, you know, their divisional heads to a conference for a week and, and thinking maybe that somehow is going to change something. And uh, sadly it doesn't, it might inspire people for a moment. Um, but if we don't know how to address culture and to actually shift culture, then what happens is, you know, like many of us, we, we very quickly fall back into old habits. We succumb to the prevailing culture again, um, and uh, and then and then the the desire to want to to try and change it again after that is, you know, it's it's significantly diminished. I like to talk about the big word leaders. Uh, it's thrown around all the time. Everyone wants to be one. They get all the recognition, all the hate too. But you know, they're on the cover of magazines. They got the big paychecks. They have the status, the legacy. What is a leader and what makes a good leader? David, that's a great question. I've got a 21-year-old and a 19-year-old uh, who my 21-year-old is very engaged in the influencer culture right now. And uh, one of the greatest disservices we've done to these younger generations is to allow the idea of being an influencer to be abstracted from the concept of leadership. Um, so this is my philosophy is that everybody's a leader because I believe leadership is synonymous with influence and impact. Not everybody has the same positional role or title as a leader, but if you're a friend, you have influence and impact on your friends. You're leading them more than you realize. You know, if you're a parent, you're a leader in your household. In your marriage, you're a leader in your marriage. You know, both couples, you know, both of the couples are. Um, in any organization, no matter what layer, if you have influence and impact on other human beings, you you are practicing leadership. And I think that we've got to reframe our understanding of leadership so that we're tackling the right issues because we think of leadership as, oh, once I get that title or position and that paycheck, then I'll start thinking about leadership. But at that point, it's too late. For most people, it's almost too late at that point because the pressures of the responsibility of that role and responsibility are so great that it crowds out the space 
for people to think well about how am I behaving, how am I operating, how are my attitudes and behaviors affecting and impacting people? You know, am I investing in other people? What's my mindset as I go into these meetings? These are all things that I really believe, uh, at least in the United States, I can speak to. Um, I'm hoping at some point we're able to backfill that and to really take seriously how we're developing a leadership mindset within people from a much younger age. So th that's, that's, I can get long winded on that, but that's for me um, why I think the conversation around leadership is important. Why, why all of our content, our books, though I primarily work with high level executives, owners, um, uh, but am passionate to put our content into the hands of all people. My 21 and 19 year olds have been trained in the tools that I train high level billionaire executives in um, because we told them at a young age, like we're going to set a radical minimum standard of what it means for you to be a human being in culture and society. You will have significant influence to the rest of your life on all these other people that you interact with. I mean, even so much as the person who's checking you out at the grocery store or the, the people you're driving next to on the freeways, we have influence and impact, you know, in that space. So, we've been working really hard with our own kids to help them develop a mindset that recognizes that influence. I, I tell people, I said, stop at the, the right question is not, do you have influence? The right question is, is your influence currently in whatever spaces you have influence, is it an asset or a liability before we wait to get to that positional leadership? Cause like I said before, at that point, it's almost too late. It's not too late. But it's like, we're, we're, we're way behind the eight ball at that point. What have been some of like the biggest transformations, let's say, that you've seen as a result of your coaching? Oh, I, I get asked this quite frequently and I always try to think of new ones when I can because there's so many. There's so many. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I'll give you a couple, uh, I'll give you two that for me stand out in this season because I don't work with my clients, you know, forever. Um, they, they always in seasons and so... Um, I'll, I'll pick some fresh ones. Um, one uh, is a a young a young uh, younger leader, is what I would say, uh, who stepped into and I'm just for confidentiality sake, I'm not going to divulge too many details, but uh, um, very quickly rose the ranks to become a to have a very senior position in a kind of well-known organization in the country and uh, a kind of a celebrity type organization in the entertainment business and got to that position partly because they were qualified in terms of their character and competence, but completely untested in terms of their ability to take on that scope of responsibility. It was really interesting. I normally get called in by a leader when they have tried everything and they don't know what to do anymore and they're desperate. This young leader called me and said, I, I, I heard about you through a mutual friend, a mutual connection, and I'm stepping into this role. I am very aware that I've never done this role. I do not know how to do this role. Uh, I'm still a little surprised right now that I got <laughs> selected to play this role, but clearly somebody believes in me. And however this turns out, I, I want to know that I, I gave it my best. I did my best to make sure I have the kind of support in partnership to give me a fighting chance to do this really, really well. And, um, and so this individual inherited a highly, highly, highly dysfunctional, um, team, uh, and was tasked not only with, um, a significant amount of turnover that was required in the first phase of his leadership. Um, was also tasked with transforming the culture because getting rid of people does not necessarily just transform. You can get rid of all the toxicity you want, but that prevailing culture has to be shifted. Um, and so it was tasked with that responsibility of shifting the culture um, and then doing all this in an industry where uh, that is, is, is at times overly preoccupied with immediate results. And, and so there's a lot of tension this individual is going through at a very young age. I, to this day, I say this is one of the best young leaders I've had the privilege of working with, young being like in their 30s, when most of the people in their position are in their 50s. Or well, Here's what I can tell you that impressed me more than anything else. His willingness to 
allow me to sit in a, a, a ton of different meetings in different contexts and to sit in and just listen and observe. And then afterwards we would debrief. How did he operate? How, what was his performance? Where did he do well? Where did he not do well? What could he have changed? What could he have done better? How could he have spoken to this individual? You know, he was dealing with leaders that were 15, 20 years older than him who had tons of seniority who were still, you know, subordinates. <laughs> so, so many different dynamics. And about what this individual committed to was the only way I'm going to become a better version of myself is by creating space for somebody to speak into that area. Um, rather than I'm going to give it a go on my own. And if it doesn't work, then I'll go get help. Um, I was very impressed with his initiative. Um, and uh, today um, I, I've, been, I've worked, been working with them for probably two and a half years. And uh, today I can genuinely say, and, and we're talking everybody involved in the organization will attest to um, the, 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 the toxic people have been, were given a chance to either change or remove themselves. And that has happened. The culture is radically different. Like rad, like all, like the previous culture is like not recognizable anymore. It's not there. Um, and uh, thirdly, he's not only gained the respect of uh, the owners of the organization, um, but has gained the respect of people across the industry for his ability to make those changes in a short period of time, a relatively short period of time. This stuff isn't over the night, an overnight thing, but, um, and, um, and has, has really set this organization up for an incredibly successful future, regardless of whether he remains there or not. So that's, that's one, one big one. The other one I would say is just a, a very a specific story. I work with a, a company up in LA. They're a kind of a, a raw commodities distributor, like flour, oils, that kind of stuff to the larger bakeries around the country. And, um, you know, and uh, we started working with this executive team and, the, and the, um, I introduced them to one of the first tools and, and where we talk about learning to identify when we get triggered. Right when we're mentally, emotionally, physically disrupted by an experience, could be a conversation, a text, an email, body language from somebody else, whatever. Bad news, um, and how easily we get derailed, we get hijacked when we get triggered, and when we get hijacked, we're operating out of insecurity and fear, and so oftentimes we go into self-protecting mode, and we kind of we, we start to say and do things that we're going to later regret. We're not operating as the best version of ourselves. We were talking about the practical handles about how to recognize when we're triggered or even hijacked and, and what is our ability to recover from that? So we're, we're in this part of the coaching process and I get onto a, one of our weekly co calls with that executive team. And before I could say a word, the president of the company says, Eric, I got to tell you something, something really, really big happened this week. I said, Whoa, what, okay, what, what happened? And, and this is a group that had been stuck. They had worked with, I don't know how many coaching consulting groups for years, spent lots of money, didn't see much change. So we get to the goal. I can't tell you, I, I, I'm, I'm over the moon. I said, what happened? What happened? He said, okay, so last week, somebody on our team accidentally sent an email out to all their vendors with all of the pricing lists on that email, accidentally sent an attachment that would have told the vendors everything from how much they're charging those vendors to the profit margins they're making on those vendors. And we're talking like really confidential information. <laughs> a huge snafu. And he said, this happened. I, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, heads are going to roll. Who's already been fired? What's going on? This could become a PR nightmare. And he said, and Eric, when it happened, when I got the phone call, he said, I was able to immediately recognize that I was feeling triggered and that I was already going down that trajectory of feeling hijacked. And I was already thinking about whose heads are going to roll, who's going to get fired and how I was going to tear into our executive team about how this mistake could have even happened in the first place. And he said, and I didn't. So what'd you do? He said, I called immediately the next day an emergency meeting with the entire executive team. I reminded them that what we'd been learning together and that we're all triggered and we all want to point the big finger and blame somebody else for this, this mess up. 
but we decided you've been telling us about the power of personal responsibility. So what we're going to do, instead of looking to blame and project responsibility, this is our organization. This happened on our watch. We're going to take responsibility for the fact this happened, and we're going to figure out a way to move through this and to solve this problem without having to throw anybody under the bus. That, David, literally was like the first pivot moment for that team and that organization that that signaled to me, oh my gosh, they're not only getting this, but practicing it. But if they continue on this journey, it is going to radically transform the trajectory of this company. And I can tell you, a year, I've been working with them about a year, year and a half. And I can tell you that it's, a, it's an organization owned by two amazing families. And it comes with all the benefits of a family owned business. And it comes with all of the the baggage of a family owned business and they have done so much hard work and they're literally a transformed culture because we always start at the top and work our way down. Um, and so we've now two or three layers down of leadership, radically transformed ways of communication, uh, decision-making, conflict engagement, working through difference of different opinions in terms of all the different divisions of their organization, like just radical change. But I always go back and I remind them of that that one, that first moment when I say, guys, I can give you these tools. I can teach you how to use them, but you've actually got to have the courage to put them into practice. And the reason it takes courage is because for us and our coaching work, everything starts with personal responsibility. Like as human beings, our tendency is just, we want to throw everybody else under the bus. We want to blame the world for why things aren't going our way. We want to find out who's going to you know, fall on their sword. I said, but as a leader, the moment you do that, you create an environment that communicates everybody's for themselves ultimately. And you no longer have a team. You no longer have a healthy culture. You no longer, you're, the, the engine of that business is going to sputter and fail eventually. But if you can demonstrate and model for the people on your team, hey, we're, we're all going to make mistakes. This is not about throwing each other in the bus. This is about trying to figure out together we got into this mess together. We're going to find our way through this mess. Um, and it doesn't mean people haven't had to be let go over time because of toxicity issues. But that to me, those are, those are the kinds of celebrations at a very small level that over time turn into really significant breakthroughs for a team organization and culture. I just always remind them. If whatever you want to see change in your organization has to change in this room first. And if you're willing to fight for those changes in yourselves, then you will see those changes then begin to filter out into the rest of the organization. And that's what we're seeing happen with them. What are like some of the smaller companies you've worked with in terms of size? Like what's the range up until like the larger companies? Could you help contextualize that for us? Yeah, that's a great question, David. I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to be really honest with you. When we moved back to California and I started this new coaching business, started with nothing because I actually left the, the the specific industry that that other coaching organization was operating in and, and reframed our whole coaching model and process and practice. And so, you know, like most entrepreneurs and we moved back to the West Coast. And most of my connections were not all East Coast. We had West, but I mean, you know, I, I, I didn't get to take all my clients. And so, you know, I basically started by starting to call up friends and network and say, hey, this is what I'm, I've started this business. And if you'd like to be interested. So literally we started with very small uh, businesses. And what I mean by small, we're talking small in terms of personnel. <clears throat> you know, five people on a team, 10 people on a team, then eventually grew to 15 to 20 people on a team. And then it grows to 100 people. And then it grows to hundreds of people on a team. Um, and, uh, and so in the, in a span of seven years, you know, we went from a, I think year one, I think we were at a revenue of around, I'm just, you know, I don't care if people know this, a revenue of around, I think, you know, 50 or $60,000. And then this last year we finished at well over a million dollars in revenue, the scope of businesses that we're working with, um, uh, you know, went from more really small solopreneur type practices and maybe really small businesses. Um, and now we work with, you know, organizations that people in the public know and have heard of names that are, are familiar. Um, and so I, you know, and if, if somebody asks me like, what's your sweet spot, I, I have been fighting hard to build a team of coaches 
who can, you know, the way they cut their teeth is with some of the smaller organizations um, as it should be. Um, and then hopefully they are able to, as they develop their capacity, they can take on larger and larger clients. We're very careful because it's our brand and I want to make sure our, our customers, our clients are served incredibly well. Um, when it comes to my capacity, you know, people see on our website, you can go to our website and see who we've worked with. And people are like, oh, that must, I'm like, no, no, we work with the whole gamut. You know, it just depends on what's needed and what coaches are available. And because all of our coaches are trained in the the leadership operating system, or that's what we call it, our toolkit. Um, they know our basic practices. Um, and then the larger organizations, what I like to say is we have all of these component pieces that our coaches have to learn over time. And the larger the organization, the more of those pieces are going to probably be at play in the contract because we really, we really, really work hard to make sure that every organization we serve, it's a very customized approach, not custom in terms of we're not developing different tools. That's a lot of the same principles, DNA training, um, but we want to make sure that we're serving organizations where they're at rather than just providing this kind of, you know, here's the track everybody has to run on, whether you're you know, a, a two person operation or a 2000 person operation. Well said. We well, left us with some really great thoughts and advice tools that we can take in our daily lives, even if we're not, you know, a, a, a leader of the caliber that you mentioned. Is there anything that we didn't mention regarding leadership uh, or influence that you feel we, we should we should really mention at this point? I often get asked this question. If there's one piece of advice, what could you share? I, there's one, I have a million that I've learned over the years, all from smarter people than me. But there's one thing that that we haven't talked about that I haven't said that I love being able to share with, with your listeners is um, the best piece of advice is that we so quickly get caught up in how the world's not being fair, or what we didn't get growing up or who did what to us and what's not going our way. And, you know, all this, th that mentality, that mindset of the world is happening to me and somehow the world might be against me. And probably one of the most significant pivotal trajectory shifts in my life was helped by a mentor who helped me wake up to the fact that until I started taking 100% responsibility for my attitude and my behaviors, the fact that I have far more authority and power over my life and what comes of my life, that life is happening for me and not to me, I think people are going to stay stuck. And so for anybody listening out there who feels stuck, who feels frustrated, it doesn't matter what level or position of a leader they are in an organization, or they're just a, a struggling parent or in a, feels like a dead end marriage or whatever, po then the politics aren't going their way. You know, I tell people there's a lot of stuff that we don't have control over, but there's far more stuff in our life that we do have control over than we don't have control over. And that begins with really taking responsibility that my attitudes and my behaviors are my choice. Nobody else. I don't get to blame anybody else. Maybe when you're four, you get to blame somebody else. But in your adult years, you realize, no, those are my responsibility. And I get to choose what I make of every day, whether it's sunshine or it's rain. I like that. Well said. So uh, where would you like to point people? We mentioned your website. Is there anywhere else you'd like them to check out or follow you? Any socials? David, I tell people this all the time, please, please, please go to our website, sign up for a free one hour coaching call. We're not looking to get anybody to sign a contract or to do business with us. We, we just are, honestly, the mission of our business is, is to help people recognize the potential they have um, in, in, in to change their own life and the world around them. And so if, if we can just get on a call for an hour, hear what people are wrestling with and potentially connect them to resources, maybe even resources from another business or another space um, that will help them unlock their potential. That's that's what we want to do. Um, obviously, books, uh, it's, we have everything online. They can get everything through our website. All the resources are out there. But I'm far less concerned about that than encouraging people. Um, I've been told by so many people, Eric, that one hour changed my life. Amazing. Well, thank you for that. Um, it's a real pleasure speaking with you. And I agree. Let's do a part two sometime. I love it. David, thank you so much for having me.